So really, what I'm trying to do is, I'm really trying to do something meaningful with my life before I die. And uh, everything I do in terms of YouTube, and then I'm going to be moving on to other stations, is all aimed, basically, at trying to um, somehow uh, fill in the emptiness or the void that we don't discuss uh, in real life, that people just don't talk about. A lot of the unspoken truths, the hypocrisies that no one mentions, right. the lies, the selfishness, the brutality that happens to human beings who, who do not fit in for one reason or another, or are not part of, so to speak. What that does to human beings, really the, the inherent cruelty of things that this could happen to me or to anyone, you know, so whatever. So uh, in other words, I guess I'm, people say I'm a cynical, so I guess it's really a, an effort at cynic, uh, I really want to be disrespectful, I guess, or irreverent. Uh, I, you know, what do they say? Um, holy cows. Um, how do I, I don't want to sound. Okay. It's like um, the author um, Celine, uh, who wrote, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, Celine. He wrote, Celine, he wrote uh, in, in the early 19, very early 1900s in France, leading up to World War One and then World War One itself. And he was very disrespectful towards France. Uh, towards patriotism, he thought the whole war was insane, and indeed he, he actually had fascist leanings, by the way. Mm. But he wrote this book called Journey um, to the End of the Night. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, the, well the, there's another one that's similarly named. Uh, I always get the two mixed up, but I believe it's Journey to the End of the Night. Uh, yeah, and... It was a tremendous hit in France, and it's still a classic, but the point is that the bourgeoisie in France, the people who were telling everyone, all the young, probably working class types, to run off to war and die, not telling them to die, but to fight for the country and all that's good and honorable and all that stuff, he made a big joke out of it all, just by being honest. He said, it's bullshit. And, and the bourgeoisie, the proper people, so to speak, were outraged, and it was banned, and there's hardly anything in it. He doesn't, he doesn't say burn the flag. He doesn't say fuck. <laughs> I want to screw him up the ass. Huh. He doesn't have any explicit sexual happenings. There's none of that. All there is is a kind of shock and astonishment at the stupidity of it, and the insanity, and the idiocy of it, and that people, what are they crazy? They're shooting at me. He would say things like that about the Germans. Why are they shooting at me? What, what are they, crazy? And, what, and what, what's happened to everyone? Is everyone crazy? Simple questions like that. Is everyone crazy? It was an outrage to the patriotism, the supranationalism of France at the time, with all their ceremonies and their martial parades and all that crap. It was an outrage to the French leftover empire. And so what I'm saying is, is that he, he got in trouble just for kind of commenting almost naively on things. Just without a political agenda, just saying, look at this, can you believe it? And it didn't fit in with the party line, with poli the political establishment with the party line. And so I guess, you know, I sometimes I see myself thinking a little bit like him in that well, all I'm really interested in is somehow not speaking the party line, not for the sake of, of being a uh, not for the sake of being a radical or being controversial for the sake of being controversial and trying to make waves. No, 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 no. I all I really want to do is say it. The, I, I don't even know how to say it. It's one of the, I'm, I, obviously I can talk and express myself, but I have trouble saying this because I'm not sure how to put it. But. Um, I just want to say things that are a form of ironic commentary, I suppose, to put it to put it very bluntly, put simp simplistic. I don't know. I mean, irony is pretty popular these days. <laughs> it's nothing new. But um, 
so the, the point is I've concluded, here's really what it is. I've concluded, like I wrote in that little letter to you uh, on Facebook, I've included, I've, I've concluded that basically various meta narratives are dishonest. Uh, that that yeah, honesty is what I'm interested in, if possible. The various meta narratives are dishonest um, because they attribute uh, justice and truth and meaning even to things that don't intrinsically carry meaning. Uh, suffering is not redeemed by the meek shall inherit the earth. Um, there's no redemption in that sense because you just suffer and then you die. That's it. Um, if you do suffer, I mean, if you happen to be someone who suffers. So various meta, various meta narratives that try to console us with platitudes that are supposed to say, well, there's a reason for this or this serves a good purpose in the long run uh, or, or God wants you, not, you know, uh, and other kinds of cliches and bromides and uh, platitudes that justify things and say, I should actually be happy with this uh, and impose guilt on you if you're not happy. It's actually a crime not to be happy. It's a moral <laughs> crime. Uh, it's a moral, yeah. there, there's all these subtle moral crimes that people can commit. Uh, and one of them is being, of course, very irreverent, disrespectful towards certain received notions. Uh, you know, like, for example, I, I was in a bagel, uh, a, a deli a while back, a nice deli, not just a deli, tables and everything. This was about a few, four months ago. I was visiting my stepfather in the hospital. He had a minor stroke. I went to go get a cup of coffee, and this very working class girl, uh, presumes to tell me that uh, I should be grateful. I forget exactly what for. And uh, she said, this is why you should always be grateful. Life is a gift or something like that. <laughs> a very common thing to say. And I kind of, and I got really pissed off at that because she, first of all, who the fuck is she, t she to tell me to be grateful about anything? Who the hell is she? You know, what does she know about my life? Nothing. She's speaking in generalities, platitudinous, uh, which is a made-up word, generalities, and I'm supposed to fucking listen to this to her, you know. It's and take it as some sort of divine wisdom. It, it, well, yeah. In other words, it's pseudo-religion. It's um, it's uh, it, it, it's obscurantism. And you know, we're not allowed to talk about uh, if you believe in the truth, the truth. We're not allowed to talk about what happens often, devoid. With, without referring to certain, well, you know, uh, pseudo aphorisms like, uh, well, you know, that's just life, or just the way things are, or well, you got to be grateful, you know, you know, it's no, you don't have to do any of that. Why do we have to do that shit? And it's like, why do we have to smile even? Now I understand it can be menacing if you look at another man he doesn't smile. I understand that, but physically menacing. But I've realized, if you look at the photographs, the black and white photographs from 100 years ago of your old family, they weren't smiling, at least in this country. I don't know what they were doing in Chile. In this country, if you look at them, people, my family did not smile from 100 years mm -hmm. ago in photographs. In this country, now everyone smiled. You're supposed to smile in photographs. Now, the reality is that when you see people on the street, they're not fucking smiling. When you see people at work, they're not smiling. They're just ser as serious as ever and as pissed off as ever and crazy. But in photographs, you're supposed to smile. In advertising, you're supposed to... And what I realize is, is that smiling is, in a sense, a new form of subservience. It's a form of slavery. You have to smile to the boss. You have to appear happy. The boss, you've got to be positive. That's a key word. It's a catch word in our culture. Be positive. You see, there are key, right. there are key right. words that have that have auras of uh, sure. Because to smile yeah. means that you don't get to criticize because you're happy. Because you're happy. You're you're an automaton. Right. You're a fucking robot, and they call it customer service. So I'm all into treating customers well. Don't get me wrong. I like doing that if if I'm in that position. But 
the point I'm making is it's un-American to have to smile all the time. Uh, you know what I mean? It, it doesn't fit in with the spirit of critique. So um, basically, th these are the kinds of things you get in trouble for speaking your mind, essentially, with simple things. I, it's like I, I, this woman, she told me to be grateful. I said, I, you know, and then this fucker in AA, he said, I, I wasn't feeling good because I was lonely. I was broke. I was seeing all these bitches I wanted to fuck, and I couldn't fuck them, even though they were fucking giving me the eye left and right. I knew I couldn't talk to them because of my situation. This fucking guy in AA, I stopped going to Alcoholics Anonymous, he says to me, this is a few months ago, oh, don't worry, it gets better. It's a big saying in AA, it gets better. Now, putting aside the fact that one has to ask, what is it, and you listen to my it versus everything, Right. Uh, what, what is this it that gets better, first of all? But it, it, he doesn't specify any... First of all, he assumes, let's take it for granted, okay? Let's take, take it for granted that there is an it. It gets better. Now, in other words, there's uniformity. It happens to everyone. It always gets better. After you stop drinking, it gets better. I'd already had a year and a half without a drink. And he, what he did, and I could, I could detail this in numerous ways essentially was stick my life and my personal experience at that moment into a meta-narrative. And that meta-narrative essentially was the 12-step narrative, which of course is tied in with a quote higher power, i.e. God. So it is my life, that's what the it is. It is the aura of generality, it's a, a meta-narrative, uh, a, a narrative, a teleology. I'm in it, I'm in it, and therefore because I am in it, I will get better because it gets better, and this is just normal therefore, for me to be unhappy like this, I shouldn't be complaining, <clears throat> see? In other words, I shouldn't really be unhappy about the fact that I'm unhappy, because it's normal for me to be here, and it gets better anyway. So this is not really a crisis I'm dealing with, this is just a phase. Then they call it a phase. Now, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, it's not just a phase because I'll, I'll die that way. Mm. But, so he, he's caricaturing my existence, existence in general, and he's making it into a one-dimensional creature. So, basically, um, uh, uh, and one other thing, he's assuming when he says it, that the reason I'm not happy is because of this it that he's referring to, when in fact I was unhappy for other reasons in his it. He thought I was unhappy because I still wasn't able to drink, and I wanted to drink, and I didn't know how to deal with life, and, and I, was, I was confused, and learning about how to be a human being, and live, learning about uh, not always getting what I want, and um, uh, basically, in other words, I, that I was an alcoholic, right? That, that, which is a personality type, and that I was simply going through what any alcoholic goes through when they haven't had a drink for a year. Um, first of all, I'm not an alcoholic, and I, and I have doubts about that definition in general for anyone, at least as AA defines an alcoholic. Secondly, I, I was not unhappy because I couldn't have a drink. I, I don't think about drinking. I was not unhappy for the reasons he assumed. Um, and I know what they assume in AA because I went for 15 years. Uh, never worked for me. Uh, so everything, his, his sentence itself symbolized an entire superstructure of thought, of assumptions. Because when they go to AA... They are, they are confined within a self-referential, redundant reasoning and where they confirm each other endlessly in their belief system and don't experience any exposure to outer uh, realities that might challenge their beliefs, i.e. a cult, um, although it's a cult light, perhaps. So uh, this is how they succeed. Um, it's self-perpetuation. And then they have a program for taking in more people. It's called 12-stepping someone. Uh, it's, it's conversion, it's proselytizing, etc. They call it 12-stepping. They would deny that. 
But the point is that he tried to fit me into that. I was outside it at that point. And I got really pissed off because he tried to pull me back into that reasoning. I'm just in part of this it that they're all a part of. And whatever it is, uh, the reason I'm unhappy is the same identical reason as everyone else in AA. And because it gets better for everyone else in AA, it'll get better for me because we're all part of it. Now, first of all, it doesn't get better for everyone else in AA. That's a crop full of shit. And they blame the people who don't get better. And the people who leave, who stop coming, they say it's their fault they're still drinking because they're not in AA. You know, uh, when in fact they may think AA is the biggest horse full of shit that, and that even someone who has a drinking problem has a right not to go there. Maybe. Based on reason. That thing called reason. Sorry, guys. So... They've got all these assumptions, these universalizing assumptions uh, that uh, they have all the answers. And so I'm very, very sensitive to any kind of semi-totalitarian meta-narrative that attempts to induct me into its, into its, uh, gymnast its mental gymnastics. I'm not fucking interested. When some, this old woman at a restaurant, I was with my father, I wasn't smiling. She told me, she said, we have to smile, you know. A seemingly innocuous statement from a woman in her 70s is trying to make me feel better. Okay? But she noticed the verb, have to. We have to. Now, I'm supposed to feel like I'm wrong for not smiling. Now, a lot of people say, what are you getting upset about? Just an old lady trying to offer her your sympathy. No. She had an expectation. First of all, she's older, therefore she has authority. So I'm supposed to listen to her. She's got wisdom. You see, so there's an expectation built in. I'm younger. I'm supposed to respect it. Respect your elders. Yeah. Uh, respect your elders. She's saying, um, uh, we have to, uh, which uh, you could say, well, just a colloquialism. Um, but in fact, have to means have to at least if you take it literally. Uh, she's making more than that. She, she's really making a spiritual or philosophical statement about life, which is that it sucks. Uh, so we just got to smile because it gets so bad. Um, now, again, it's a generality. She didn't know. Now, whether or not you agree with that philosophical statement, we, we smile. Uh, we got to smile because it just gets so bad and you just got to get yourself through by smiling, which is a platitude that I've heard in many different forms. Um, you know, it's all how you see it. They say stuff like that. It's all how you see it, um, which is subjectivism run rampant, of course. But um, she says, um, uh, she says this, and whether or not her philosophy is correct, let's put that aside. The point is she's assuming that I'm unhappy for, she, first, she doesn't know why I'm unhappy, and maybe I'm not unhappy in a way that quite fits in with that way of thinking, and I'm having a little trouble here. What I mean is, is that maybe I have a reason to be unhappy. Uh, she's not denying that I have a reason. Maybe, right. maybe I have a reason. In other words, maybe I have a right Maybe I have my own philosophy that says I have a right to be unhappy about something. Right? Right. You know? Basically, she's saying I don't have a right to be unhappy because it somehow it's morally wrong. That's That was the implication. I get that from people. Now... We're criticized. For, we're supposed to smile and be happy. It's like it, it's a fucking moral injunction. It's like one of the fuck. It's like the eleventh commandment, and uh, it's all bullshit. And um, you smile if you have a reason. You do not have to smile. There's no moral law that says you have to be happy. You. It's only reasonable to smile when you're happy, and it's reasonably happy when there's a reason to be happy. If I, had, right. if I had what I wanted, I'd be happy. They say, no, no, just because you get what you want doesn't mean you're going to be happy. Well, let me decide that, for Christ's sake. Fuck you. When I have what I want, I'll find out. 
And you're wrong anyway, because I know if I got what I want, I would be happy. <laughs> so, right. um, you know, I don't need these static cookie cutter philosophies that turn everything uh, into uh, a, a one dimensional uh, procedure. I take it, I try to take it case by case, moment by moment, without meta narrative. Uh, in other words, uh, no moment is predefined by any conception. And, uh, it, and I got a right to do what I want to do, period. If I want to, okay, and I have a right to want what I want. And I have a right to say that if I don't get what I want, I've failed. And no, it's not all about spirituality and how you look at it, man. You got a right to have standards, even if they are foolish. So, you know, anyway, so it's the platitudes I'm surrounded by. Uh, and to me, these are the things that bother me. Because, uh, you know, despite all these feel-good platitudes, uh, the fact of the matter is the American population is not any happier than it ever was. Uh, there's like 60 million mentally ill people in this country. Uh, we've got about 40 million, 30 to 40 million people who abuse alcohol to varying degrees. You've got, this is the biggest, the, this country consumes more cocaine than any other individual country in the world, uh, including the entire European Union, far more. Uh, we're more violent than any other industrialized nation in the world. We've got more addiction, more mental illness, we die younger, and our quality of life is lower as rated by the UN, 26 in the world. Lower than some third world countries, so-called. Lower than Cuba, for example. So, a lot lower. So this idea about smile, man, and uh, be happy, and uh, it's all on how you see it and all that bullshit. Let's study the Tao Te Ching. Let's study Buddhism. Let's study the 12 steps. I mean, you know, if you want to withdraw from the world, if you want to withdraw from any kind of material standards, any kind of notion of objectivity, okay, go ahead, do it. But, um, you know, in the Constitu in the Declaration of Independence, it says the right to the pursuit of liberty, whatever it is. The point is that um, there is a collapsing of the right to, ex to, to, to want, even. And uh, particularly among marginal groups, they've been brought into programs like 12-step groups which really teach them that happy happiness is elsewhere. It's not in this world. Just like Christianity has to the poor for a long time. And um, I could, of course, analyze that, but there are these platitudes. They're given to the poor. They're given to the weak. Well, God will take care of you. It used to be, you know, this world doesn't matter, heaven. They can't quite always get away with that now, so they say, Things like don't be so materialistic or don't expect so much, smile, it's how you see it. Uh, and, and the platitudes you run into day in and day out. And if you're a cynic, if I go to AA and I act cynical, it's amazing. It's like they, they don't, they don't, they can't acknowledge it. They, uh, they've learned to think uh, in a way that is like sheep. It's, it's harmless. It's innocuous thinking designed to produce no waves, no controversy, or no disagreement. And they all talk about the same thing, about how they used to drink and how they're doing the 12 steps now, repeatedly, for years. And this program, the 12-step program, controls in America the tremendous multi-hundred billion dollar industry of rehabs. It controls government policy federal government and state and city government policy. It controls uh, the health agencies and, and their attitude about how to deal with alcoholism, which I don't even believe is a co properly understood term, by the way, uh, by most people. Um, and, uh, you know, so, um, 
you know, the, the people who are getting what they want, who have nice apartments on the Upper East Side and are getting banged by the beautiful ladies and have time to read good books and vacation and party, they're not all saying, uh, well, God wanted it this way for me, so it's okay. You know, they're not saying that if they're, if they're living it up, if they're happy or if they're enjoying themselves or if they have power in life, real power. Power to control their events and their lives and the events of their employees. You know, no, it's a different ad. This is the way peasants think. And we become a nation of peasants who turn to these gurus and who turn to these Buddhist monks and whomever else as a way of co consoling themselves for the pain and being taught that you can't expect anything in this world. Um, and, and there's more and more poor people in this country. And I'm, it's a very popular thing. So essentially, uh, the platitudes are what bother me. Because to me, they indicate an entire mindset. And uh, this happened in Rome with um, Marcus Aurelius, uh, who withdrew from political life because he realized Rome was hopeless at that point. P politics were no longer virtue because politics did not yield positive results. And he became a stoic. Find happiness in your own garden. Remove yourself from political public life. Because uh, he'd see that he saw that Rome was basically declining. Politics did not yield good results. It was no longer a virtue as it was in Republican Rome. So he advocated a philosophy of withdrawal, quietism, just take care of your own garden. In this country, there's been tremendous withdrawal from the public life and an accompanying philosophy. Uh, and, and we're more and more withdrawn from the public world. We sit behind computers. Everything's being privatized. There's no sense of uh, common participation. So a lot of these platitudes, they justify uh, a certain kind of apathy uh, or a redundant situation that goes on and on and on. Uh, you know, feminism was not born in this kind of environment. Uh, you know, the radical 60s were not born and unions did not come from this kind of environment. You know, so th this is a this is essentially a decadent period we're living in. And all this so-called uh, spirituality is just individualistic, solipsistic bullshit uh, uh, designed to console a bunch of lonely people who don't know what the fuck to do with their lives. And uh, so anyway, so the kind, of, the kind of thing I'm interested in, it's, everyone I fucking meet is insane. It's, the kind of thing I'm interested in, basically, is in somehow, if possible, getting people involved in some kind of reinvigorated discussion. And uh, the truth of the, you know, Cornell West, who I don't agree with because he's a Christian, but I was reading one of his books the other day, and it's amazing. He's saying the same shit I just said. Obviously, he, maybe I should say I'm saying the same shit he said to give him res the respect he deserves. But he, he sees this. You know, he says he, the, the young people, uh, like he was referring at first to blacks, and then he said it was a general situation. They have no thing to be a part of. No thing. So, anyway, this is... <laughs> I started again. So uh, basically, uh, I got reason to be bitter. That was the first point. And the second point is I, I, I refuse to bow down to any platitudinous, which is my made-up word, consolation. consolation. Right. And one final point, I'd rather die in agony and burn in hell forever than do that. Uh, one final point, and that is that... Um, uh, in, in in the strangers, Camus is a stranger, the main character, Matthew, after he murders the Arab. He's in the prosecutor's office, at least as I remember it. And the prosecutor asks him, does he believe in God? And, and it's clear he doesn't. But what's even a worse offense than the fact that Matthew doesn't believe in God is that he doesn't believe in anything. See, that's the moral outrage in that book is that this man is a criminal because he refuses to believe, period. So, to me, one shouldn't even have to believe. Keep, someone says to me, keep the faith. I said to him the other day, how can I keep something I never had? 
So even though I did, he got upset. People don't know how to answer shit. When you, when you actually answer them, these platitudes, and actually respond to them in normal language, they do not know how to respond. And they will not talk any further. Uh, of course yeah. not. So um, my goal is to upset uh, platitudinous ideas, a sequence of platitudes uh, linguistic platitudes that go on and on and on to somehow upset that chain, to break the link, if possible. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, break things down um, so that uh, people can think about their bullshit. You know, it's like uh, one last point that is an AA, the motherfucker said to me, thinking is the problem years ago. I said, no, it's not thinking that's the problem. They all blame thinking for the problem. Now, they're right. It's their thinking that's the problem. It's not thinking in general. It's their thinking. But I said, no, it's not thinking it's the problem. It's what, what kind of thoughts you have that can be the problem. It depends on what you think. No, no. You know, so, I mean, there are, you, he, guy's telling me not to think. So, it's like, I'm not even supposed to think. Even thinking is considered wrong. By certainly by and the twelve step programs are enormous in New York City. So, uh, so yeah, I got a couple issues. I can't believe you actually sat through that listening to me, man. Hey, I, man I, 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 like, I assume uh, you listened. <laughs> I mean, I I see you looking down at that goddamn ground. What are you falling asleep? No, are you no, no not at all. This way. This is no, no, I don't do that. Um, no, I was actually masturbating, and uh, no, I'm yeah, kidding. You better be, buddy. <laughs> now, let me just tell you one thing. No, you, 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 you would have heard more, more movements, you know, like. No, no, don't worry. And let me just say one thing since it was I who started talking, I started recording. recording. I didn't want to record what you were saying about your girlfriend and all that, obviously. But once I started blabbing, I recorded it. Now, I hope that's okay. Yeah, you're kind of like a CIA now. Well, I, it was I who was talking, and I don't know if I'm going to have a chance to say that stuff again. So, I... Well, I thought it was... I, actually, I like the whole... I like the whole... Uh, what shall we call it? Spiel. Um, no, but spiel is kind of like ne negative. <laughs> uh, spiel, huh? So... So let me just say that it, it, it's recording now. If you got a problem with that, I'll turn it off. Mm -hmm. You may be tired. You may want to go to sleep. But you see, if I talk this much, you see why I have a recorder. It's like I have to, I can't just let it, it's unproductive for me to talk that much and not do something with it. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, if, if you wouldn't mind, now I know you're, you're probably a little tired right now. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you'd like to, um, uh, and, and we could actually time it um, so there's some order to it. If you'd like to have a discussion with humble meek me <laughs> about any topic that you think we can both talk about um, and have me record it, um, uh, you know, maybe this sounds arrogant, like who the fuck wants to listen, but you are a professor after all, and, I, and I'm a talker, so I'm, I'm banking on that if I record it, put it up. Right. So if I put it up... Well, it depends on the topic now, doesn't it? Well, of course. Um, Let's talk about horrors. Well, if you want to talk about horrors, we could talk about horrors, sure. Why not? And the definition thereof. That, well, that that's certainly... Uh, I would say that's a good one. Because, I mean, we're not going to talk about conventional horrors, you know, the chicks on the street, you know, what, uh, what Robert De Niro uh, um, saw uh, in Taxi Driver, you know, his um, character. Jordy Foster, you think? Uh, I mean, uh, Sybil Shepherd. Yeah, Sybil Shepherd was probably the biggest whore in that movie. Well... You know what? 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 Can 
we um, can we um, can we put aside a time to talk about that? I'm sorry, I'm just urinating. Keep keep on going. If, if you flick it more than twice, it's masturbation. It's jerking all right, off. All right, buddy. I mean, what the fuck? I mean, whatever happened to people like, um, I don't know who. I mean, Celine, he's, he's a perfect example. Long day's journey into night, to the end of night. Where, where the hell is the critical spirit outside of academia? I mean, where the hell is the thinking, for Christ's sake? Yeah, 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 no one's meant to think nowadays. That's not the point. When I say thinking, I mean where is the right to respond to a situation? Uh, you don't have it. Not a right anymore. I mean, everyone's supposed. It's everyone's supposed to be. Uh, Critical thinking is an eccentricity nowadays. Was it, it, you think just nowadays, or I mean? Oh yeah, nowadays, last 20 years, it's an eccentricity. You don't get to critique. I wonder why. Well. You, you get to be like, uh, you know, uh, you get to be like, unless you're Rush Limbaugh. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't critique, yeah. per se. He justifies the establishment by critiquing people who apparently critique the establishment. Yeah. yeah. No, you, you, you get to rage. You rage in favor of. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, these... That's, that's, no, no. Crit, critical thinking, I mean, this is all seen in... This is all... Oh, president. It's, it, it's, it's dangerous. You know, you can be accused in this country of being um, well, outside the mainstream. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, in the 50s, they, they called it, you know, with McCarthyism, communism, and um, it, it's dangerous, actually, to speak uh, certain ways. Sure, um, sure. I mean, we've got in this country, we've got um, um, we, we've got actually the government, the federal government, uh, the president and other people in the, at the top levels, anyone authorized uh, can, can literally see any email ever sent in the country at any particular time. And that may include they well, they they have a computer system that somehow collects and tracks and gathers every single email in this country of every individual. Um, I, I, I think, think, I think I'm, imagine having to be having to filter that shit. Jesus Christ, what a job. Well, what a computer. <laughs> what kind wrong. of computer? I mean, is that a Dell? For some reason I doubt it, but you think about the size of that computer. It tracks every every email, and um, you don't know what they're, I mean, they've got these, rend, you know, secret renditions, and right. I told you what I had to do with my landlord. I put up the American flag and the Barry Goldwater glass and, and the Bible. Right. Um, so, um, it, it, and, and the thing is, there aren't any organizations to turn to if you are a, quote, radical of any kind, if you're not on the right. At least, like, in the 60s, you know, people were, on the, on the other side, they were organized. So they, I guess, to a certain degree, at least, they stuck together. So there was someone you could turn to if you were in trouble, maybe. But, uh, and I'm, I don't want to generalize about that, but now it's like we're so splintered as a culture uh, that, you know, they're just, it doesn't seem to be the case. And, uh, but in any event, it, it, it is dangerous to, um, uh, you know, to say certain things. 
and uh, I've, I've really come to the conclusion, Louise, that um, the ones who have it right uh, are, are, I know a thug in this neighborhood, uh, and he's, he's a little dangerous, and he owns a jewelry shop, and he's gotten in trouble with people and, and, and all these kinds of things. He wanted me to work for him, and he's a fucking thug. He's not dumb, though. He's smart. But he's he knows what he knows what's up. He knows that the game is fixed and that it's full of crap. And he's right. I don't agree with his at his criminal uh, uh, propensities. Uh, at least his kind of criminal propensities. But I don't suggest being a thug is what I'm saying. But um, criminals often see things clearly, in my opinion. A lot more clearly than 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 the real criminals, you know. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, good. that's because they're not utopian. Well, the, yeah, are they, are they, the idea is Machiavellism here, uh, and the idea was always in Machiavellism to to see the way things are, not the way they ought to be. Which, which is which also meant seeing things beyond the propaganda. Seeing things what? I'm sorry. Beyond. Beyond yeah. the propaganda. Beyond the propaganda, yeah. Yeah. So, so, the, so, you know, the 16th century Italians were very clear on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but Machiavelli represented um, the prince. I mean, established interests. Exactly. Exactly. That was the point. That was the point. And it was. And it was it was uh, an anti-Christian attitude. In other words, it was an anti-ethical attitude towards the conduct of politics. So, so they say they said let's look at things. Let's look at things uh, the way they are, and not the way we should, uh, not the way they should be, because we're deceiving ourselves. We live in a hostile environment in a hostile world. And if we use ethics to deal with other people, we'll get fucked. It's kind of like um, playing chess in a dirty way. Um, yeah. Even chess had to be, to be, uh, had to be uh, played um, with deception. Hey man, you know, hey man, look at the birdie up there on the wall. And while you're looking at the birdie up there on the wall, the guy makes a move on the chessboard. Right, right. So, uh, so, uh, so, they, so they realized early on that, uh, that uh, the political business was sort of, sort of nothing, nothing to do with nothing to do with that. No, but I, I, yeah, yeah, it's 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 interesting you said that because it, it's, it's a very you know it's a very provocative statement you know what you just said right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because uh, let me just say first of all that that wasn't quite. Uh, When a prince does it, it's different than when a person at the bottom does it. It's not the same thing because they have different reasons. Yeah, and, uh, that actually, that actually, that's quite, that's quite that's a precise, precise, precise word. And it was called, and it was called the state. Of state. Yeah. yeah. But they're, see, they're more corrupt than the lower level criminal. Because, because... The lower level criminal is a victim because of context. Right, right. You see, so I'm looking at context. I'm not only looking at. I I, I can't look at it in a vacuum. Uh, and uh, I think the criminal's outrage is a form of morality. In fact, the condemnation of pseudo values that someone like this fellow I know. He clearly has no respect for the people in his neighborhood who are all these white, li white well-to-do liberals. He's not exactly white. 
in, in a sense, it's a form of moral outrage. Because he knows they're full of shit, and they are. The way they treat him. In his mm -hmm. jewelry store. So it's his way of getting back at them. It's a form of justice or morality. He may not quite articulate it that way, but I, my guess is he would if, if I pushed him to it. And, uh, you know, it's like he said, for example, um, now the prince who does it, uh, I would imagine, obviously, my guess, my personal guess, is that um, he doesn't necessarily have a sense of outrage against those who oppressed him. Uh, he may, I'm not saying it's impossible, but um, he's the fucker who makes the problem worse. Because he's got all the he's he's got the ability to fuck other people. He's got the power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. So anyway, uh, this guy he's like, um, yeah, you know, this guy's kind of a thug. I mean, I, he actually was confronted by a customer when I was in the store with him by a woman who accused him of stealing his jeweler, her jewelry and putting it in the window. Uh, and she looked at it right there and pointed it. But, and I know another guy who had a big confrontation with him, the cops had to come. So, and I've read reviews of people accusing them of outright theft. Um, anyway, it's, it's hilarious, but uh, um, they know that the people in this neighborhood look down on them as inferiors. You see, so that their decision to be thugs is a recognition that really the culture they live in is like is thuggish. Because they're looked at as thugs, even if they haven't done anything wrong. See, they're mistreated. So really their 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 behavior is a form of justice, of compensation, of I'll get mine. You you treat me this way. Well, okay. Well, then I'll be that way. So fuck you. And uh, you know, uh, in in the Godfather, um, uh, the book, which I actually read, believe it or not, by Mario Puzo about ten years ago. Very, it wasn't a very good book, but uh, the movie, you know, his 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 theory. His theory, Puzo's theory, the narrator's theory about um, about the guy, about why the Godfather became the Corleone became the Godfather, why he turned to criminal behavior, was because he was an Italian, and at the time that Italians immigrated over here, they were you know they were the bottom of the heap, just just above blacks, perhaps. <laughs> And he knew he was a great man, and he knew that they would not allow him to be great, society, because he was Italian. He would not be able to act on his greatness legally. The laws would stop him. Uh, so that the only way for him to fulfill his inner greatness as a human being would be to break, would be to break the law, because they wouldn't let him otherwise. You see, so... The, in other words, uh, the hypocrisy of society of not allowing him to behave like a human being legally uh, by becoming, let's say, a senator, because he was a great man, according to the book. He could have become a great, powerful person uh, legally if society embraced him and, and accepted him as a human being. But it didn't. So he had to do what he had to do. So he became a, quote, criminal. <laughs> Because of criminal behavior on the part of the establishment, those who owned America at the time, and still partly do. And they were not Jewish, by the way. They were wasps, um, Midwesterners who owned a lot of property, and East, East Coast wasps. Uh, so uh, they were all Gentiles. So I, I, I see the criminal, basically, in many cases, as really um, just someone who wants to be free. Um, 
So maybe that's naive or idealistic of me, but I, you know, I just, uh, it just, it just the way I see it, it's, it's there's so much crap that's going on, so many lies, and so much bullshit in in morality, in standard morality, in, in social morality, in in the law, in expectations. It's all a bunch of crap because there, there there is no freedom here. I mean, there's certain freedoms in the sense that, you know, we have certain basic rights in this country that are often violated, by the way. And we've lost a lot since 9-11. But uh, this, this, whole, this whole system is basically about slavery. I mean, we've, I mean wage labor, we wage slavery. We've imported all these immigrants who have no rights and they come here just just to be able to eat. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm cynical. Maybe I'm exaggerating. But uh, everything here is about fucking money. Okay. Mm-hmm. I don't. It, you know. Oh, whatever. Okay. So. Um, it's well known by intellectuals now in this country, uh, who write for left-leaning magazines. Uh, or even kind of center that the public space has been abandoned uh, and that the goal is constant privatization and that the idea of a public space which is where market comes from that from agora I think which means public public, right okay public space place for communication you know We've abandoned any notion of political solidarity or participation or identity to the idea of this abstraction called the free market, the marketplace. It's absurd. It's like we're not fucking human beings. And and, and the thing is that the people who run the game can pack up and leave whenever they want to and go down to Mexico. So we have to obey. And then what the hell happens to the people? What happens to the average guy or gal who doesn't have a nice family to help them out? You know, what are they a part of? Forget about the issue of jobs and money. Just put that aside. What are they concretely a part of? Are, are they part of an organization or a group? Do they have group protection? I mean, a, cor- a corporation has, is a corp- it's an organization. People are organized. They're part of a group. You see, it is actually a group, physically speaking. And they have they have resources to keep the group together. But what other center of organization is there in our society? What other basis for group identity is there in this society other than race or class? Um... You know, where does the average person, who represents him? What group, does he have corporate lawyers to defend him when he gets in trouble? Does he have connections in Congress? Does he even have one person he can rely on in his fucking life? One. He's lucky if he has one human being. He's lucky if he can rely on his own mother, given the way people are so nuts. It's each man for himself. That's what it is in this country. Everyone knows it. That's this country is a very capitalist nation, as I'm sure you know, the United States. More so than any other industrialized nation in the world, probably. With the exception, maybe, of England. Yeah, and even more so than England. So, you know, the, the people who have, who have, are part of a group are, are, are lucky. Um... You know, what institutional power structures are there? What groups, essentially, are there for others? The unions have gone down to a very low percentage of the workforce. Right. You right. know, what groups, who, who turns to whom? Who the fuck do you turn to if you're in trouble in this country? Do you have a group? Are there groups? So, and I'm not talking about professionals who have their conventions and and their wives and and their 401ks. In a sense, they're part of a group. 
although that group is very tenuous because it depends on economic situations, <coughs> circumstances in the country. Economy goes down, some of them lose their jobs. They're no longer part of the group. But I mean, there's millions, there's tens of millions of Americans, hundreds of millions, who are just average to poor. And they, they're not part of any group. They're not part of any block or institutional block that gives them any kind of support. They're on their own. Uh, and the few programs they have are under attack um, right. by the government. Right. And by the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, so uh, corporations, the corporate power in this country wants to destroy the government because it competes with them for power. That's my opinion. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I have a, I have a, I have a, a little video, a little video by this, uh, by this, uh, that I keep, Keith, uh, Keith Oberman. Keith Oberman, yeah. Very, very interesting little thing. A comment, a comment that he, that he, that he, how big, how big, how big is it? Because I can send it to you. Send it to you. And it's one of the most massive critiques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, seen, that's I've great. Seen, uh, uh, are you, are, are your regular call? speakers oh. on, Louise? No, no. I mean, I mean, yes. the next speakers, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of feedback. Where, on your end or on my end? You're, 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 you're at. You, wait, what do you mean feedback? Do you hear it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the fuck is going on. But I got to get this fixed. All right, well, let's see. It. Can, I don't know what feedback there is, but... Um, all right, maybe it's that fan that's causing the problem. I mean, it doesn't see... Can, can you do me a Can you say something? <laughs> Can I say something? Can I say something? You know, it's, 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 still going, it's still going on and off over here for some reason. Yeah. No, yes. It, it, bothers, it bothers me. Does it go up and down for you also when I talk? No. No. Oh. But I can hear, but I can hear myself reverberating. Oh, you can hear the reverberation, huh? I, I really don't know what's going on here. I'm going to have to call up um, someone to get this fixed, uh, unless I spend time trying to figure it out myself. I'm sure there's something I can do. Um, no, forget it. No, forget it. You can, nothing you can do. Well, you learn that. You learn that. You nothing I can do, huh? <laughs> You're fucked. You're fucked. No, no. I, yeah. <laughs> Let me try this. Um,